Uh, this is Latashi with the American Indian Foods Program through the Intertribal Agriculture Council. And we really appreciate everyone taking time out of the day to join us for this awesome webinar led by um, our amazing colleague, Stephen Bond. He is our Southern Plains Region IAC Technical Assistance Specialist. Um, and he'll be covering small scale farming techniques. And he'll go ahead and share more information about that. But I want to let everyone know that we will have a Q&A session towards the end of this webinar. Um, we do have, uh, if you could submit all of your questions or even just comments, feedback um, in the Q&A chat area or even just in the chat, and then we'll revisit um, towards the, the last end or the tail end of the webinar. Um, again, thank you guys for joining us. So take, take, take over, Steve. Okay. Well so we've we're gonna we're gonna just jump into a real broad subject that that traverses uh, a, a series of crops. I'm gonna set my timer for. Um, Lottie, should are we going forty five minutes and then questions? Yeah, we we can go ahead and do forty five minutes and then okay. take questions after. Okay, I'll set a timer because I'm terrible at keeping that. Um, so so small scale farming techniques. Um, th that's a the a, a real broad range um, it could involve uh, uh, subsistence production up up to uh, um, you know a more uh, commercial definition of a small scale farm into the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and and uh, proceeds from from crop and that's that's more of a like that's when you get into food safety regulation changes and and um, and different um, and, and a lot of different issues. And, and you know, obviously we're gonna, uh, we'll talk about a, a broad range of, of equipment. Um, 45 minutes isn't long. And so we were gonna uh, continue this discussion in, in more of a series format. And so in, in your comments, um, af, you know, after we've, after we've done the talk, um, you may um, uh, provide, provide some um, ideas for things you, would, you, you wanna hear about uh, in more detail. Um, we'll discuss irrigation, um, we can talk food safety, um, we, can, we can talk um, uh, all kinds of equipment selection and, and the actual um, uh, cultivation techniques, um, ir um, irrigation in greenhouses, irrigation in soil. So let's, let's just get started. Um, oh, let's see, all right. So I, I thought I'd pull up this definition of specialty crop production from USDA. So you can see where, um, where we're um, most importantly for us American Indian groups that are doing some novel things, um, they do uh, include wild harvested plants as long as there's a, a management protocol. And so it could be a, a, a fire regime um, that, that could um, uh, bring your, your specialty crop into inclusion so it would have access to programs because we're, we're also going to try to parallel the talk with, with USDA programs and opportunities. And um, although that may be a, a, a moving target right now with, with the, the current COVID conditions, um, the, there should be a lot of um, uh, uh, programs still out there in, the, in the, this, this farm year's, or this, this farm bill's budget and um, it may be some new programs available. But I, hopefully that was enough time for y'all to read that in depth um, definition there. And we've got wild harvested, so you can see I bolded. Uh, in order for a plant to be considered cultivated, um, we need some form of management for application. So I, in my mind, that could be a, a, an IPM strategy in an area or fire or clearing, um, hedgerows um, in a forested system. Um, and I know that this is this would be especially applicable for, for for Alaska folks, and I found it fascinating, just dig, digging this up. I had never just actually pulled up this definition, but um, if y'all um, um, if you go back to the the section 101 um, here, you can you can pull up more information on that and in the Agricultural Act of 2014, and and use that at your local offices if need be. Um, if we're doing crop insurance, for instance, and you've got uh, uh, records of the last three years. So, um, so I thought I would, I would kind of um, tackle this in skeletoscope of equipment because equipment's one of the most important things. Um, I'll go right into a discussion of irrigation. Um, every small scale producer or specialty crop producer 
on the on the uh, on the vegetable and and berry and nut and um, fruit side is is going to be um, um, tied to the machines, um, except for your your subsistence production and and, um, and 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 extremely small scale. And so so we go from hand tools and small tillage machines, and it brings up the classic garden type with a with a rear tine tiller. Um, I had a craftsman. I believe it was like a five horse or, or, um, or maybe a 3.5 horse for years. And I used to, I would till up a rectangle and, you know, you, 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 you have a, a row of, of, of vegetables that was probably 24 or, or 30 inches. And then you run your tiller between for your footpath and another row of vegetables. And a lot of us grew up with, with that kind of classic um, garden. And, and even within that, that, uh, the tillage machines, you can bump it up to a, uh, a more of a commercial approach with the BCS, and I'm sure most of y'all are familiar, and we'll talk about BCS in detail. That's a particular brand of two-wheel tractor I like, but there are others, and, and that's a more intensive um, cultivation technique, and that, that gets you into some precision seeding. Um, folks that are doing micro-scale farming or the micro-farming um, are usually doing stacker planning, so not all of one crop is coming on at one time. So you do like one tenth of your, of your lettuce every week. So you're harvesting for the market. Um, if y'all have seen paper pot um, transplanters, they're a really great way to plant alliums and to get lettuce out. And people are doing all kinds of things with those now. Um, they're in a very intensive system. You have to have your own trans, um, uh, trans, transplant greenhouse essentially to grow these specific pots um, it, in flats that fit into a paper pot transplanter. So you need vacuum seeders and, and to have quite a bit of foresight um, to, to use those. And, and they're pretty pricey. A lot of the BCS specialty equipment is the Speedo pota potato diggers can fit on the larger BCSs. And they're also um, something that would fit work well on a 12 to 35. And they've Speedo makes things for, for 120 horse tractors. Um, so with a BCS, you can get into some plastic culture. Um, I'll share a link to Earth Tools and they have video on um, a series of videos that you can watch on um, applying uh, plastic culture on for flat ground production. Um, that doesn't work as well for the ridged um, beds because the BCS is very close to the ground. And so you have a limitation there. Um, I've started using a, a um, I believe it's a 12 horse um, Sato, Beaver Sato tractor. and they're, they're pretty rare. They're, um, they were the predecessors for a lot of the Mitsubishi tractors, um, but 12, 12 to 20 horse Mitsubishi tractors are readily available on Craigslist and, and used throughout the country. And I found them to, to usually be in pretty good working order. It's just a, a solid tractor for market. And um, the, these specialized tractors, um, what, what sets them apart from, from just any other tractor, I mean, is, is really the, the configuration. And so um, the, the, you have narrower tires that are taller, so that gives you um, less waste between the rows, allows you to, to set taller beds, and allows you to go over and cultivate um, for, for, for weeds. So you can use finger weavers and different three-point attachments on the 12 to 35 horse tractors and on up. Um, the, the BCS, I've got a series of, of examples of things I use with that. And you can also do some, um, some basic weeding in the front, um, front part of a, a planting before the plants get tall. Um, but but um, I usually hand, hand work those beds. Um, so you've got your um, 35 to 65. That's going to do all of your, um, the, everything that a 12 to 35 can do, but, but, but better um, usually. And, um, and you, might, you might get into some double rowing, but, but um, usually not. Now, when I talk about uh, market beds and, and cultivation beds, we're, we're, we're usually in the, the, the 28 to, to uh, 36 range. Some people do four foot beds, but, but it's usually gonna be a, a 36 foot bed, 32, 30, 31 inch bed uh, when it comes out. Um, the 65 to 80s, um, now you can do some, some deep tillage. Um, you, can do, you can recondition the beds. You can, um, you can do a, a double um, uh, transplanter 
so you can have a um, it's essentially a, a if you if you're not familiar with that we'll pull them up and in the next series we'll we'll have a lot more about equipment and and um, and initial uh, choices as you're developing a farm uh, but the, these transplanters skirt the ground as a three-point attachment and you can have two people that are pulling transplants off of flats and the water wheel transplanter makes your dibble um, into your bed or a double dibble and you put your plant in the ground and so you can traverse acres uh, very very um, very quickly and less painstakingly and of course, 80 and up, um, you know, there's all kinds of specialty equipment in those scales. And, um, and we, it'd still be within the, the, the context of this talk um, for small scale producers. Um, but, but we're getting into some very, you know, you could also have large, uh, large scale production at the 65 up. Um, you just may have multiple tractors. So um, specialty crop production is kind of how I'm gonna frame this um, going forward. Um, is very site specific. It's very regional. Um, program accessibility can vary regionally. Uh, for instance, if you were in um, oh the uh, in Vermont and decided you were going to um, grow sweet potatoes and peaches, they they may look at you cross. Um, or or vice versa. If you were in um, southern Texas and you were going to grow um, see um, fox grapes you know you're you're probably not going to get any um, assistance from from your usda office because those crops aren't aren't um, regularly grown in those counties and so they so the um, for, um, most most particularly insurance is what i'm what i'm mostly talking about but um, you're not going to be able to insure your crops if that's something that people don't grow now if you find that you're you're trying to insure a crop that folks don't you know that we're not normally insuring in that county and you can find, um, you can go three counties out, they can do an average. Well, if you're outside of that scope, um, then you have your own records, you, you can use your own records. And so it's not a dead end, but um, typically um, you'll find, when you find a, a peach producing region, you'll find many producers producing one, one type of crop or a lot of peaches, because you also need secondary processing and so you're going to sell a lot of those peaches as as beautiful specimens right in a box um, out the door. But you're also going to have a lot that have had uh, bug damage or, or or don't meet the food safety guidelines if they fell on the ground um, that, that you're going to want to um, try to recover some income on. And secondary processing is important for that reason. Um, irrigation is incredibly important uh, for, for um, even the smallest commercial scale production. Um, and so we're, we're generally talking a 60 cubic acre feet for, for vegetables. That's a lot of water. Um, the wells that you'll see on a, on a, on a 10 acre plus site um, are, are gonna be in the 100 to 300 gallons per minute. And so that's a commercial um, irrigation well and you just don't get that water just anywhere. And so um, um, beyond that, um, the, the, depending on what type of crop you're gonna grow, we would um, we would engineer entirely different um, um, irrigation systems and and um, head houses and packing sheds and everything's going to be site specific, and so um, so the it's good to be um, think thinking about. I know some of y'all are already in production, and some of y'all are 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 um, we're putting together an operation amidst all all of this um, um, change um, and and are, are facing some challenges uh, getting seed and, and different products right now. But, but the, um, if we think about how we're setting up an operation and we engineer it um, for a five to 10 year plan, it's gonna save us a lot of headache going down. Um, and it's gonna increase our inclusivity into some of these programs. And so I, on this bottom point or second to the bottom, I, I said required two out of the last five to qualify for assistance. Um, for irrigation, we can start irrigating um, in a beginning farm operation and we, we want to take records. And if we're doing farm food safety, we're going to be taking records anyways, because that's going to be part of a, a farm food plan. And that's beyond the scope of this talk, but we might um, include some of that as well. And so um, NRCS will help you design irrigation specific to your region, crop, soil type, environment. They'll take into account transpiration and infiltration <coughs> rates and, and help you through that process. 
um, which can be great, greatly beneficial, but they, they also are um, usually akin to designing the larger scale systems. So, um, so what we're looking at right now, and hopefully y'all are seeing the same thing as I, um, is a, this is a small scale raised bed system I was setting up for trellising um, tomatoes. And I had had an intern that year and we'd set up an irrigation system. So you can see in the bottom right corner, we have a water box and, and I raised the PVC out of the ground so I could do um, a Venturi pump um, where I would, where you use a, a, a vacuum pressure as the water goes through the tube to deliver the supply line, you're pulling a, a percentage of a, of a fertilizer solution. And we'll go into depth on that, on that type of um, technique, um, which can be you know, really simple and a great way to get distributed fertilizer for small scale production. Um, here's another picture up close to the box. So this one just has one, um, one solenoid you can see down in the box, it's black with an inline filter. And we were just getting started on this. And um, here's Matt um, running out the drip line. This is Polytube. Um, I use this on smaller scale systems and community gardens because it's more, um, it, it's not indestructible, but it can take a whack from a hoe or, or if you get too close to it with a tiller, you know, sometimes it'll live. But um, I use a lot of lay, um, lay flat for a connection instead of PVC on your on your um, supply line and um, on on the commercial systems and we use a lot of uh, a tape because you can roll tape out on a three point hitch over your tractor and i've got i've got some pictures of um of a of a, my little beaver sato laying an acre of plastic culture and some drip line to show you all too so i i adapted a bcs um, plastic culture machine which i don't i didn't really like it so i'm not um, giving it a, a huge recommendation but um, with some modification, it's, it turned out to be a pretty decent machine. So here's just um, a picture uh, of me setting down in the trench. We've, we've trenched out our, our, um, all of our delivery line because there's a lot of activity on the farm. And so that way we, we didn't run the risk of busting a, a pipe by running over it. Um, and, and also um, the, we have freeze here in Oklahoma. So I'm lo located and, um, and, and, this picture is near Stratford, Oklahoma, but but um, we you know our we we have to locate our supply lines a foot below ground uh, to 14 inches. Um, here's some more um, variable variability when you're designing irrigation. I just put this up as a um, more of a uh, a consideration. There's the soil type, your pH, all these all these things go into designing your your farm and where you're at. Kind of dictates what you can grow based on the, the hardiness map. And, and so um, for, for those of you all that haven't visited this in a while, um, it's got a, a cleaner detail so you can get down to the county level. And um, we're, um, we're working with the farm up in, um, in Gaquio Farms uh, near Irving, New, Mex uh, New York. Um, and they, they're in a microclimate and it's, and so it actually shows that. So um, they're in um, two, two zones separate uh, from, from uh, your typical growing environment up there and are able to, to get away with a lot more um, cool varieties. So we'll just briefly touch on farm food safety. There's a lot of online uh, uh, opportunities for training. I'd say take it because it, it beats sitting in a room for an entire day um, you know, of their, of their choosing. So you can do it from the comfort of your home. And here's the Produ Produce Safety Alliance website. Um, they also have some wonderful information on the, the National Good Agricultural Practices. Because when we're doing specialty crop production, we've also got to consider what we're going to do with, with the produce. And, and um, by, um, although the, the um, FISMA regulations and the produce um, um, produce safety um, aspect of, of, of food safety is, is required at certain scales, most of us on this call would probably be exempt. Um, if we're going to market our produce, um, the GAP um, or the National Good Agricultural Practices isn't required by law, um, but more so um, enforced by, by industry. And so a lot of folks won't buy your produce unless they're GAP certified. So if you're a certain size, 
um, the, um, I'll just read this verbatim for the purpose of part 112, a covered farm, um, that would be meaning you have to um, uh, abide by the FISMA guidelines and, and, and um, go through the food safety training. Um, on a rolling basis, the average annual monetary value of the produce on the farm sold during the previous three years is more than 25, but not, uh, no more than 250,000, then, then you would be defined as a very small business and have to take this produce um, um, food safety class and, and, um, and follow, follow those guidelines. Um, here's the compliance dates. You can see that uh, those had been rolling out in a, um, at a, um, at a, and there was some change. Um, but the, the crux of, of the farm food safety for, for us very small farmers is, um, A, are we even growing something that's regularly consumed raw? Um, because if we're not, then, then we, they're non-covered crops and we, we don't have to follow the, the FISMA guidelines on non-covered crops. So here's a list, uh, it's an extensive list, and here's the covered produce list. Um, so these are the ones that would um, ha have you in that class and have you doing a farm food safety plan and um, taking water quality test. And so it's gonna, basically it's gonna increase your, your record requirements, which you may already be doing if you're trying to get into an organic standards protocol um, or you're doing GAP certification. It, they're, although they're different, um, they're, they're all moving in the same direction. Um, so this would involve, you know, ma maintaining compost and keeping record, um, developing your standard operating procedures, um, having a, a clean, uh, a clean sign-in sheet um, for bathrooms, and and just writing down some of your 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 mixing procedures and techniques, and and including that into your farm food safety plan, which is also going to be site-specific for everyone. And so we can go more into that. Um, but I, I thought it would be fun to introduce some of these two-wheel tractors and small-scale equipment um, that I regularly use and have, have gotten out all over Indian country. And um, we're going to come back to these um, web links. And I, I, yeah, I think it's going to let me click them. So we'll see if that happens. If not, I'll just pull up a website and share, the, share that screen. But um, Earth Tools, they're, I believe they're in Kentucky. And, and um, they're very knowledgeable about BCS and these small-scale equipment. They've been utilizing them for um, for for 20 plus years, and and they were the first to bring uh, some of these little Italian tractors and and um, strange European gadgets to the U.S. And I've had some bad experience with with other um, other folks throughout the country that are selling these and not knowledgeable. Because um, one thing you'll um, you already know if you're a specialty crop producer. Um, it's specialized, <laughs> and and you can't just go out and buy the tool um, always to 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 make the um, the particular row or the cultivation technique you need. So it it sometimes it involves a welder or a, at the very least a hammer. Um, and Earth Tools it does a great job of getting you the the um, the the parts that you need to add to to get to get going. And and um, Joel's a wonderful resource, and we'll get online with you and, and go through your problems. Um, um, Buckeye Tractor Company is gonna be that next intermediary um, level where we're gonna get out of a two-wheel tractor or a very small 12 horse and we're gonna be into the, um, up to the to 60, 80, into the hundreds. Um, but they have some great implements for that 20 horse range as well as the 60, 80 range that we'll talk about more specifically. Um, so this is a, a John Deere 332, and it's a it's got a a, um, a Kohler diesel engine on it, and it's got a three point hitch, and there's front hydraulics, and it's not what we think of as a farm tractor, but but um, these were some of the first estate tractors that John Deere put out, and they're collectors items, and I've I am um, I just I just gifted uh, my uh, partner in crime and and horticulture. Um, one of these so he could have it at his place because I've got the beaver's toe and and we we lease a tractor um, you know when, when we need it and when we're doing infrastructure development but but this was a great machine and um, you see this is a three-point hitch with a spray tank and I used that for a couple of years here's the beaver's toe and we've got a, a nice landscape rake on it that we use to clear off beds sometimes and just around the farm 
Um, I've got four acres where the where a lot of these photos are shot, and um, there's over 38 pecan trees there. So um, here's the the beaver chateau out at the ranch, and we're putting in an acre of plastic culture, and you can see this is us getting started, and we've got some some barbell weights on the front, and we ended up putting a log across the plastic culture machine just to get the right weight, but um, this was in heavy clay, and plastic culture does not like heavy clay. It's, these techniques are usually site specific and developed for purpose, and, and so you're going to be, um, you know, a lot of the, the plastic culture techniques were developed in, in um, Arizona and California to, to control precipitation, um, uh, in addition to excluding weeds and um, but the there you know they were developed around a, a, a sandy soil and in general it's ill-advised to to plant uh, vegetables in anything but a sandy loam um, but if if clay is what we got we work with it when there's some things we can do so i i bought this um this is a little uh, uh mini ditch witch uh, or mini skid steer and I use the heck out of this thing for, for market farm scale all the time. Um, so this is actually a truckload of, um, of nice soil amendment that we're putting on a community garden site. And I was able to level that out in a little longer than it would have took me um, doing it with the tractor turning around and stuff. Um, but also it was too small to site to get a, a regular skid steer in or, and, and not as, you know, not warranted with that scale of soil amendment. Um, Okay, this is a, a, a Grillo um, two-wheel tractor with a Power Haro. And you can see in the background, this is a tiny little thing. I think it's eight horse, um, but in really soft soil, it was able to, to put up these raised beds that, we've, um, that we utilize in, in this part of Oklahoma. Um, I, I switched to a pretty tall raised bed um, several years back because we get all of our spring rain um, all at, all at once, and um, and it's, I can usually plant before all the rains come in, but then the seeds drowned out. If you're planting our ancestral crops, um, you know, like our like our corn varieties and beans and squash, sometimes they would mold uh, or rot in the ground. So this this um, heats up the soil faster. Um, it, it provides a dry basin around a perimeter um, to to act to act as a water uh, catchment, um, and and I I think it minimizes the weeds I don't, but it's they've they've been really great i've since i um, just kind of i do a 31 inch version of these now and we don't do these larger ones anymore um, here's a bcs and here's a great introduction to a bcs because without modification and and um, putting on the correct tires the wheel extensions and all the things that you're going to need and weighting it down correctly um, it's just a big tiller and so right here you can see we've got a um, their old style the old earth tool style uh, wheel extension. And what that does is that sets your 31 inch bed. And so now your tires are on the outside of the bed. And so you're gonna take those off when you're doing like regular soil tillage or, or heavy soil work. There's ripper bars and all kinds of things for these little BCS units. Um, but when you're, when you're doing bed work, if you're doing precision seeding or you're gonna run a power haro, you're gonna have to have these um, wheel extensions. And I've got a detailed invoice of a BCS purchase we just made recently. So that'll give you an idea of cost and we can go over that um, in a second. So here's uh, uh, a bird, a rotary plow. <coughs> it's just a different um, brand of rotary plow on the BCS and, and it's on the, um, this BCS is an 853 diesel and it has the old Lamborghini diesel engines in it because I've had it forever. But um, Here's the, here's the 853 with a toll bar. These are the Aldo Bigioni toll bars. And they, um, they, they, they accept a, a wide range of implements. So the, you see the big hunk of, of, of metal in the center that's attached to the, to the BCS as one piece. And then you can change out the toll bar, toll bars. Um, this is set up in a, in a mound or a, a bed setter. I, I think that's what they call it, or bed ridger. Um, so we've got um, opposing 45 degree angled disc on the outsides of the beds to set our 31 inch beds. We're probably setting potato beds right now and I've got some weight on it just to keep it, keep it straight. And so if you find yourself um, with, with uh, uh, swiggly lines, you probably need more weight. And so you can see we're fully weighted. These have weighted tires 
And so I believe there's an additional 40 plus pounds of weighted foam in the tires so you don't have flats and that's an upgrade you can get through BCS. I don't know if other folks do that. Um, and then I've got a weight bar um, mounted to the, the bolts of the, of the tire well so I can slip barbell weights over it so I didn't have to buy specialized tractor weights. And, um, and there's an additional 40, 50 pounds on each of the tires. So there's about 100 pounds on each of the tires and then we have the weights on the toolbar. So anyways, um, we'd set the beds and now I'm coming through with a, um, I, I wish you could see it. So I have that same hunk of rib metal on the BCS, but now I've got a, 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 um, a, a ridger or a, a, a plow. Um, it's a, um, a middle buster, some people call it. And so it makes a large furrow down the center and you can see um, a, Amanda in the background is dropping potatoes. Um, and, and then we'll come back over and, and I don't have that photo, but let's see, let's go back. Yeah, we'll, I'll come back over with that same toolbar that's in this photo and we'll scoop the, the disc in, you know, six to eight inches on either side and cover over our potatoes and we can plant an acre of potatoes in four to six hours. And so that's pretty impressive work, um, you know, with the small crew. Um, and so here's, here's the potatoes growing on a 31 inch bed system, which is, you know, kind of tied into that micro scale farming. Um, this is uh, later in spring, us digging these first potatoes and with the BCS potato digger. Um, and it's the, well, it's the Aldo Biglioni potato digger. And you can see, so that's, a, that's your middle buster type plow, but it has bars coming up so the potatoes go through it. And it's, it's pretty inefficient and it requires a lot of, um, you know, hand labor, but they're cheap and you can grow some potatoes fast. Um, the Speedo makes an excellent um, potato digger and I should have put their link on here, but I'll tell you it's on um, Everything Implements. They sell those little Speedo um, uh, potato diggers and I'll talk more about them in, in subsequent um, videos. So this is a, a two, this is a JP3 um, precision seeder and what I'm holding in my hand on my left hand is uh, what I call the pucks and it's got little divots all around what looks like a hockey puck and in my right hand is the seed hopper and there's a, 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 a felted um, um, shoot and a spring and you're dropping one seed at a time um, as you move forward a chain um, cranks that that puck and you grab a seed and you drop it and you can see uh, um, just above that manila envelope um, there's a shoe um, and that makes your little furrow and then the the black wheel that that my um, um, partner in crime is touching um, that that presses the soil down and it, it, this is a, an, an incredible machine they're pretty expensive um, but you can put a this is the JP3 with a with the two with two hoppers. You can get a JP6 and a JP6 wide, and you can on a 31 inch bed you can do seven six or seven rows of tot soy or arugula um, carrots. You know you'd probably be more in the in the in the four range on a 31 inch bed, but depending on where you're at. But there it's a great way for precision seeding because if you know as you all well know seed is expensive for these specialty crops. And, um, and it, it saves you time from going back and weeding it out. So for instance, we can put, we can drop um, any of the mustard family, arugula tot soy, um, any of the tiniest little seeds every two and a half inches. And it just, it just helps the plants get established and is really nice. Um, here's uh, that JP3 out at, um, with Deb Echo Hawk at Pawnee. We did a little, a little installation um, and so, okay, here's the BCS again with the power horror. Um, the power horrors do a um, horizontal tillage, whereas um, a, a tiller does vertical tillage. So a tiller goes into the soil, cuts, and kicks it back up. The power horrors just spin on the top of the surface. And so they're, they're what you would use to, to just knock down some weeds. So for instance, we'll, we'll set our beds like we're ready to plant 
wait a week and then I'll come over with the power haro and knock out a, a huge percentage of the weeds and it greatly reduces our weed pressure. Um, and they make uh, an exquisite seed bed. And so if you're gonna use the JP3 or any of the precision seeders, and they've got some very fancy small scale vacuum seeders now um, that are in the six to $8,000 range, um, you, can, you would use a power haro before you did that. And they do make power haros for 35 horses and, and up, and they're, they're pretty expensive, but a, a phenomenal piece of equipment. Um, you can also use it as a rock, um, a rock rake, um, but well, okay, so here's some beds that we set um, several years ago in Eagle Butte, South Dakota, and um, there's an acre of beds, and you can see we're laying out our, our, um, our, our PVC for our water infrastructure, and this was watered on, on a zone, because even though I, I, you know, I said earlier, like ideally you have the 80 to 100 gallons per minute, not everyone does, and some people are on city and some people have a 30 gallon per minute well or um, we you know that's one of the first things i ask folks um, we can engineer holding tanks and and put timers on your pump where it runs um, off hour but it'll run you know through throughout the night and filling a tank and then we can use that tank and sometimes a pumping station or gravity flow um, to get out and in an acre of of, um, of double drip um, at uh, 0.6 gallons per minute um, on the emitters, um, point, 0.6 gallons per hour, sorry, on the emitters and the, um, the um, for ve vegetable cultivation can be done on a, on a 30 gallon per, per minute well. Um, it's just, we'd, we'd have to look at, at, your, um, at, at your variables and we, we can do that. Um, so here's the BCS JPEG or the, J, the JB3. Um, a lot of irrigation and things going out to do a, a demo. And you can see I've, it's got this fit into an old F-150. Um, here's with our wheel extensions and um, we're, we're setting our beds. Um, here's a, a, a scale of beds and these fine ladies were, were planting um, ancestral seed and so they wanted to do it by hand and um, they're, they're planting the seed and packing it in. Okay, so now we've got, um, I'm, I'm just gonna keep going and I'll come back to this page. Um, okay, yeah, so the only thing that's, that's left as far as slides, what are we doing on time? All right, we got eight minutes and 30 seconds. Um, we're, um, we'll pull the earth tools and tell me, bring your, okay. So, Bring your shed window to the front. Um, I think I'm going to have to get out of there and go back to sharing this this page. We'll make it full. Okay, so. Are, hopefully we're all looking at the earth tool page right now. Um, now these guys are going to be extremely busy as are anyone um, in, in, in ag um, right now. And um, there's going to be some, you know, um, timelines to get equipment. Um, <clears throat> typically in a, in a, in a, in a schedule, um, you, you, you do what you can. You know, if you're going to start in fall, you start in fall. If you're going to start in summer, you start in summer. But in an ideal world, um, you would be thinking about this in spring or summer, and and so you can get some herbicide out if you're going to um, knock knock your weeds down in the non-organic way, um, or get your um, all your 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 cover out so you can suppress them with with a um, weed suppression um, cloth or plastic um, in the fall, and and you would have already done a lot of your um, soil incorporation if you're using manures and, and bed setting and getting ready to go for your spring um, season. And, and uh, but that didn't always work that way. But, um, you know, so we're gonna be buying our seed and getting our irrigation components and things together um, in, in October um, for the spring season. But um, so anyways, that's a way to avoid the delays. Um, let's go to their walk behind tractors just real quick. And so you can see right here, um, 
that we've got BCS brands and Grillo brands. I've demonstrated a few of those. I'll go, um, the A53 is, is, is still here, but they're harder to, to get. Um, a lot of folks go with the 749 and it's essentially the same tractor, but it's more of a hydrostatic or wet clutch system versus the dry clutch system of the 853, and that's just what I prefer. Um, most importantly, talk to the folks about what you're going to be growing. And so if you're talking, if you're buying equipment from someone that doesn't understand your, your, um, your crop needs, your, your soil types, um, they're probably just trying to sell you equipment and, you know, and, and not a, a really good vendor for, uh, for any equipment. They should, they should have some ideas, but there's some great videos here. Um, we could, we can pull this up and see. Hi there, Joel with Earth Tools here, and we're going to walk through the new tractor setup on a BCS 749 log behind tractor. I could think of more exciting things to do um, than the setup video, but but you see, there's there's a lot of videos here. Um, we are going to go down. There's more product videos on this this green bar. Um, right now, we can get a 13 horsepower Honda gas engine uh, manual start for four four thousand four hundred and forty. Um, the electric starts recommended uh, on these bigger engines. A 13 horse gas engine is not too difficult. Um, I highly recommend the diesel engines. Most recently, there was a law that's keeping us from accessing the Italian diesel engines. And so if you can find one used, go for it. All right, so I know that we're counting down on our time. Four minutes. Let's pull up. Um, I'm going to go out of here and, and leave this to y'all. Product videos. Um, there's a whole myriad of videos. They have bell wrappers and, and sickle bar mowers for these things. And you guys just enjoy that. Let's see if we can go to um, Buckeye Tractor Company. And so it's um, www.buckeyeonline. Um, that's not the one that we want. So I'm just going to type in um, Buckeye, Buckeye M4. So a lot of these guys, uh, the websites are not all that great because um, they're really good at making implements, but their websites, um, you know, aren't, aren't the modern, easy to use websites. This website is a resource. Um, so on these videos, there's a, a myriad of techniques demonstrated. Um, they're in Ohio. They have exquisite implements that they make on site and they can custom make you anything. Um, so we can go through here you see they have two different catalogs. There's a 25 to 80 horsepower catalog, and then there's the junior catalog. We got a multi-role catalog, so that's gonna be for your, for your 75 to 250, they say. And then the garden series, that's gonna be more of your, your 20 horse range. Um, and so this is for your four wheel tractors, and um, I've seen their, their production facility, and it's really nice. Um, let's go into the, um, just their standard catalog. And um, you'll see if you go to disc betters, um, this reads like a instruction manual. Disc betters, rough in beds to establish furrows. It has a lot of great information and I highly recommend it if you're just getting into this type of cultivation to go through this website, start from the beginning and, and just learn. Um, learn the scale and, and soul techniques and, and, and their videos are amazing. Um, so we're, I think we're probably to question time if we want to do that. Yeah, definitely. So let me see. I don't know if you were able to view the questions, but we have something submitted through the chat section um, from Natalie. She said, have you, have you seen alternatives of single-use drip plastic irrigation for small-scale farmers? Okay, um, let me... So have I seen... Will you read that for me one more time? So sorry. No, you're totally fine. It um, said... 
or she asked, have you seen alternatives of single use drip plastic irrigation for small scale farmers? Okay, so, so there, um, I don't know what you mean by alternative. Um, the, so you can special order Netafem um, and, and, and Rainbird in, in smaller scale because when I buy a roll of, of drip tape, it's gonna be a, a 4,000 plus foot roll and they're really hard to handle. And I'm assuming that's what you mean. Um, so you, you can order 100 foot rows um, or, um, or 500 foot rows. It's, it's gonna cost more, but it's gonna be better than something we would pick up at a, at a, um, at a local um, garden center such as Lowe's or Home Depot. Now that being said, um, Rainbird has, has some, um, a, a, a really good website and they cater to more residential and, and, and very small scale. Um, and so you might find something on the Rainbird website and, and all of their irrigation components. Um, the, I think that they're the poly. I don't think that they do the, 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 the throwaway. Um, the dig is another um, very residential, um, small scale, more garden size, but they sell it at Home Depots and Lowe's and Tractor Supplies and Atwoods or whatever you got um, locally. So that could be um, that could be a, a a a way to get some irrigation line um, at that smaller scale. And I, I bet you can you know Google drip tape. And small scale soaker hoses aren't efficient um, for for any scale at all, really. And you would be running it uh, at a short time. Um, some people would maybe use a um, PVC with a hole. I mean, there's the, you could get creative, but but that's that's the hopefully that answers the question. And I'm going to try to pull these questions up too. So, um, you're fine. I, yeah. If I'm, if anyone wants any to ask any additional questions, you could hover over and raise your hand or um, place your questions in the chat Q and A section. And and specifically, like the um, the the types of crops you're growing and. Um, is there a is there a great interest in greenhouse production? Because we didn't we didn't cover much greenhouse production, but we can talk about high tunnels, and um, cat tunnels, and hydroponic production facilities. And I mean, if you want to, um, still we're at that very small scale. Well, to a commercial operator, that could mean a couple hundred thousand dollars. So we would be into a, a more of a hydroponic production system, um, and you know, in in a um, three hundred thousand dollar uh, budget range, but but, um, but the, the the cat tunnels folks um, are are really digging right now, as opposed to the infrastructure demands of uh, of, of the high tunnels. And we can now use that NRCS uh, equip um, high tunnel incentive to to do cat tunnels. And um, I, although I imagine it, it varies state by state, they're also facilitating irrigation. Um, development. Sorry, but the chickens have started to grow. Um, in any any specific questions? Okay, so we got a hydroponic greenhouse info. Um, so excellent. So we we will um, we will probably tackle a hydroponic greenhouse in its own session um, because then we can talk about um, automation, which is killer. And, and required um, to, to, to really do a good hydroponic system. We can, essentially, you, you, um, you know, you're going to have temperature controlled water um, with hydroponics. You're going to have uh, um, a, a nutrient solution that's going to be monitored regularly. And you're going to have solenoids with sensors that maintain a certain total dissolved solution and your pH buffers on another sensor so they can they can adjust your pH simply. Um, the, we can go with beto buckets in the, the larger crops, tomatoes and zucchinis and peppers. Um, but what, what folks are finding is that it's even, it's less expensive um, to start with plastic bags and a soilless medium, and you do a non-recovery form of hydroponics. And um, you know, with, with that being said, you can use a Venturi pump 
instead of a nutrient solution tank and go on the cheap and get something going. Um, when you get into the leafy greens and herbs and things, you're, you're going to be into a, a nutrient drip technology. Um, and those are, they kind of look like rain gutters. And I've seen some folks actually uh, retrofit rain gutters to a hydroponic system, but you're going to have a, a thin film of nutrient solution going through a gutter system in a recovery flow. And um, water temperature is especially critical for, for lettuce, um, more so than, than maybe even the actual greenhouse temperature. But um, we can talk about that. We'll, we'll also, we'll, have, we'll, tr we'll, we'll do a ses section or session on um, just working in high tunnels. I've got a lot of great photos and some resources for that. Um, the BCS is obviously a great uh, uh, accompaniment to a, a high tunnel operation setup. Um, I don't always um, uh, advise high tunnels. It's, it's, they're very site specific and, um, and depending on the model and kit that you get. So if y'all have questions, y'all can, can reach out to me um, um, and, and tell me about where you're at, um, your, your growing zone and, and the crops you're trying to grow and what your water um, source and, um, and soil type. I don't know if I said that, but but all, all those things, we can uh, make recommendations site specific. So, um, oh, Venturi for the uh, reservation tank instead of an air pump. Um, yeah, the, the Venturis are, are very simple. Um, so essentially, um, it's a, 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 a siphon pump jet um, is another word for them. Um, the, if you Google Venturi siphon pump jet, you'll, you'll be able to, to get all kinds of great info and you buy a specific venturi for your fertilizer um, requirements and um, they're 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 fit in line and you usually have a bypass so so you can um, run from a solution tank um, with the venturi so um, which would mean you would mix up your your fertilizer to like a one one hundredth in a five gallon tank and um, put a little tube over it. You turn your timer on, and as you're watering your crops, you're gonna you're gonna be fertilizing at the same time, and that's a really powerful thing. And they can get especially fancy with pumping stations over, you know, twenty acre scale or two hundred acre scale. But but uh, but the 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 principle is the same, and that's there's something to be said about that. Like the um, a micro farm is using. The only thing micro about it, it's not the revenue generation, it's not the amount of work. Um, we're using micro scale um, techniques that are, that are the same techniques that are being applied in the, in the massive thousand acre fields in California. Um, but it's just a um, specialized equipment that's honed in. Um, I'm sure y'all are familiar with um, um, Jean Martin. Uh, oh, right now, Market Gardener, Never Sink Farm, a lot of the guys that do um, these online training courses are providing free training courses or free sessions. And so I would recommend looking at them and getting on the Facebook groups. Um, the, I might have a link, um, but just Google the market gardener and never sink farm and you'll, um, you'll get to those sites and they have some great micro scale technique. Elliot Coleman, um, four season gardening. That's a great book to pull up. Um, for the folks that like books, the Market Gardener actually has a, a great book too. I don't know if Never Sinks put one out yet. Um, and there's a lot of other great um, um, teachers in, in, in the world of agriculture, or people that like to share their techniques. So. Um, Stephen, there was a, another question in the chat box from Kathleen. She just asked, can you do aqua in a greenhouse? Can you do what? Can you do aqua in a greenhouse? Aqua in a greenhouse. Okay, so she may be um, wanting to, to know about how to, um, to do irrigation in a greenhouse. Is that, is that your interpretation of the question? Was it AQUA, aqua? Oh yeah, AQUA, yep. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so we can talk about that. Um, um, Netafim, is is um here i'm gonna pull up i can never remember um 
so Netathim is a is a great resource for for greenhouse uh, micro scale production. They've got some some great emitters, and we could I think a whole session on um, on uh, greenhouse for soil um, could cover you know would that cut that topic would be in, in there, and um, we could do that. But but meanwhile, let's pull up. Um, I am just forgetting the name of of my. Um, irrigation supplier. Um, irrigation. So let me see if I can pull them up really fast. I um, so they're they're a pretty big outfit. I just Berry Hill. So sorry about that. And so I recommend it's um, it's b e r r y hill drip com, and so I would go to berryhilldrip com. Um, they have they're a great outfit, and they work really hard to get your stuff as soon as you can because every day is critical, especially in irrigation. And what I'm using right now is a, a Netafem uh, micro uh, micro tubing. And, and so I, I use a, um, a half inch supply line in the small greenhouses and then we punch holes and pop in these, these micro fittings and they have all of it on, on this um, website and they go to uh, related products. And so we'll put a 0.5 gallon per hour emitter um, um, on, on, our, on our poly bags in the ground um, for when we're um, doing our seeds and seedlings. Um, drip. It, it, it may be too difficult for me to get to every component because there's a lot of a lot of stuff. But but they have a it's a wobble sprinkler that's for micro scale, and they're very forgiving. If you've got a little bit of sand in your soil, um, they pop on and off. You can clean them and rinse them real fast, and they have a um, some nice design manuals on Netafem to help you with with that, and I'll I'll make references to those in that session, um, so we can get y'all um, going where you can design your own systems. Uh, but essentially, low PSI. Uh, if you're doing a greenhouse, I highly recommend a sand filter, um, just because you're going to be dealing with these type of micro heads and and um, irrigation components. Um, the uh, it's plug and play really it's pretty straightforward i usually have my my supply lines um, on the outside of the greenhouse um, going going in for bags with walkways down the center um, you know depending on what crop you're growing i would make different recommendations for different specialized uh, wobble sprinklers so um, so would you advise what advice would you have for composting? So um, follow a, a, a protocol um, on composting um, the, the, to, to ensure food safety and also to ensure um, really good quality compost. You're going to spin the compost or bucket with a tractor or your, your forks. Um, and it depends on where you're at. So you can go to a, a university um, extension guide and um, type in university extension composting and um, they'll have some detailed instruction on um, timelines. Um, if you've taken the, the Produce Safety Alliance um, uh, training for, for uh, the produce safety rule, um, it talks about the, the need to record those, um, those bucking events and, and the frequency that you, that you tend your compost. Um, and then um, compost, um, I mean, essentially where I'm applying compost is for the heavy feeders and a lot of our, our, our spring crops, our heavy feeders, a lot of the greens, um, 